Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind, a collection of quotes taken from what's called the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which long ago used to be called philosophical medicine. These types of quotes or theories or ideas or perspective seeks to heal the inner child. Right. The theory is that unconscious memories, um, that these memories are um, separated from our unconscious feelings. So we have both unconscious memories in one box and unconscious feelings in another box. And this inner conflict, and they're, they're trying to reunite right. um, so that we can so that it can be accepted into consciousness. Um, so by the way, that's a mechanism of uh, the mind to deal with anxiety. If the child feels frightened, the memory of the event gets put into a box and his feelings around that event that he can't feel, it's overwhelming, gets put into another box. And because from the child's mind, uh, the unconscious doesn't understand the passage of time. So it's still alive there in the unconscious. That's the theory that there is such a thing as the unconscious and that there is such a thing um, as, um, well, there's a theory that says that unconscious memories and feelings can influence our present. How we see the present, live in the present, interrelate with others in the present. Um, so the basic idea underlying that is that when there's a trauma, um, the psyche seeks to heal that trauma. So there's a mechanism called repetition compulsion. It tries to recreate symbolically in the present something that represents the past to see if the person can get some kind of better outcome for the past, but it can't be done. But that's sort of the positive intention of repetition compulsion to see if it can get a better outcome. Now, obviously it can't be done because no person in the present is the person's breast mother back in the nursery so it can't, you can't change that past. You know, when a person's born, if there's trauma there, that's a, that's a one-time event. Um, no one can redo the birth experience. No one can redo the extended period after birth, uh, called the stage of social symbiosis from birth to five months, and so on. You know, these are the kinds of things that we want to uh, accept uh, and mourn the loss of, meaning... Uh, mourn the loss of not getting the love we needed uh, to feel safe during those early months and years. Uh, so these quotes are helping us to be our own caring witness to help us mourn. These quotes are helping us to be our own fisher person because when something is in the unconscious, the metaphor is in myths or fairy tales when there's water that represents uh, the unconscious like an ocean or a river or a lake or something and something's in the lake or the ocean and you bring up a fish that means you're bringing up something from your unconscious something that was repressed or forgotten uh, but you never even knew it in the first place but you forgot it but you never even knew it it was the the no the unknown known and you make it known that's like bringing up a fish from the ocean and then uh, in the fairy tale the guy might even eat the fish so he's integrating uh, He's accepting into himself something from his unconscious. These quotes are helping us to be our own existential detective, to help us make links. Right. Uh, the, the primary link seems to be uh, not only between um, mind and body, of course, but um, between, be, uh, between recognizing um, our patterns that we habitually re-engage in over and over again like Sisyphus, when did it start and then to see it in the here and now and to sort of make that those kinds of connections. Yeah. These quotes are helping us to be our own metaphorical alchemist. Uh, can I refer you to TQ 1554 and TQ 1612? Uh, one therapist says that uh, their role is to help the client to be their own metaphorical alchemist. Meaning, if, you, if one faces the truth about their childhood, that means they're going to face the reality that the mother was both loving and frustrating. But the deeper reality is, uh, she was more frustrating than loving. Okay, 
That's what leads to the splitting mechanism. Now, when we understand the mother and understand ourselves, that moves towards healing. That gives us more confidence to bring the split images of the mother together. Okay. When the splits come together, uh, the metaphor is uh, in the story of Iron John, it's a pillow. It's a, it's a circle, it's round, it's whole, whole object relations. When you see the mother as an ordinary whole person, both loving and frustrating, then you find the key under the pillow. That key opens up the cage, and in the cage is one's golden ball. Okay. So again, in Iron in the story by Robert Bly, um, we lose our the child loses his golden ball means his feelings, his vitality, his confidence, his feeling that he's okay, and uh, his his access to his real self and the capacities of the real self and his ability to feel joy and love and um, you know his uh, just his ability to express himself and not feel guilty or uh, his natural gifts you know as a person the golden ball it gets put into this cage the cage is locked you need the key where's the key it's under mother's pillow where's mother's pillow you have to make it you have to how do you make it you rec you recognize the splitting defense mechanism that the image of the mother was split into goddess and demon images. So from the baby's point of view, because of his small size and because of what's called preverbal primary process thinking, the baby thinks in images and it's widely exaggerated and blown up because of his strong feelings. He creates images of the mother as either being a goddess or a demon or some variation of them. Right. Now in normal, natural, healthy development, these split images come together and the image of the mother is whole, and that's 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 called a secure attachment style. So a child needs a secure attachment style to achieve the psychological birth at the age of three. If now this happens when the loving memories outweigh the frustrating memories, the child is able to accept the ambivalence. But if the frustration with the mother outweighs the love with the mother, uh, the child continues to use the splitting defense mechanism, and that leads to all kinds of problems in later life prejudice, all or nothing thinking, the inability to mourn losses, uh, the inability, this constant fear of being either engulfed or abandoned by others, uh, it's dysfunctional living, uh, splitting precludes mourning, if a person doesn't mourn, um, you know, that can lead to complicate, complicated grief, as mentioned in previous videos. So, um, these quotes are helping us to um, create that pillow, an understanding of the mother as an ordinary person who, who had her limitations and, we, and we're okay. That there were some good things and there were some disappointing things and we can accept that. When there's too much trauma, we don't accept it. We're too angry at the mother, but we deny it. But to stay in touch with it, we say the opposite. She was amazing. She was wonderful. Though. That's called reaction formation. Okay. Or if you accept that the mother was frustrating and you only think she was so negative and you have no positive thoughts about the mother, that's also splitting. In that case, what the person can do is, um, I like what one author said. He said, well, imagine if your mother had been loved, if she received love. Wouldn't it have been natural for her to love her child if she had been loved so there's the good in her that she could have but she couldn't but you see and despite the fact that she couldn't she still managed some to do some things right so you got to get some kind of concept of the mother as a whole person right? um, and reparation of the other leads to reparation of the self then you get the key out from under mother's pillow, meaning your life force decathects from the image of the mother and it cathects to the self, and that leads to access to the real self and the capacities of the real self, as described in previous videos. So these quotes, um, uh, this psychoanalytic perspective, uh, so far um, we have over 30 threads, themes, or topics around this issue of the psychoanalytic perspective of how we can be our own metaphorical alchemist to get the golden ball, right? So in alchemy, the lead of your painful feelings and then the gold, okay, you turn
turn that into gold when you get the golden ball back, the firebird, and so on. Um, so we have uh, over uh, over 30 threads. Um, Margaret Mahler's uh, theory is a thread about the psychological birth. Yeah. Each personality pattern that can spring forth based on where the trauma takes place, that's a thread. If the trauma takes place between, the between birth and five months, where the child doesn't get his symbiotic needs met, he doesn't get his egg needs met, he doesn't get his, um, the stage of social symbiosis. So that psychological egg metaphor refers to the idea that babies need an extended womb. A womb is like an egg. They need an extended womb. Yeah. Humans come out too early. They need an extended womb. If the child doesn't get his needs met during that time, that can lead to a certain personality pattern. The hostile provocative attachment style, the bully pattern, uh, some of the schizoid ones, the Iago ones, the symbiotic character disorder, and some of the other ones are in there. And the main concern there is um, because they didn't get their basic needs met, the main emotions are uh, hate, anger. Uh, their energy is devoted to power and control. If they can, get, if they can control others, uh, the others aren't going to be happy, but they don't care. Right? They're looking for a connection, even if it's negative. A baby would rather have a negative mother than no mother. So the person with the hostile provocative attachment style and the bully pattern and so on, uh, they'll seek lackeys and followers uh, and expect them to uh, be at their beck and call and serve them, be considerate to them and see them and think well of them because they didn't get that. So they're trying to master the trauma of not getting it. It can't be done, but that's sort of... Uh, the positive intention of understanding their difficult behavior, right? They're trying to communicate that they didn't get their symbiotic needs met from the mother. Right? Or they were, pre as, as one author said, they were prematurely ejected out of the symbiotic egg. The child naturally uh, hatches out of that egg at the age of between uh, four and five months on average. If they're ejected prematurely, they're very angry, they seek power and control. Then their philosophy is, oh, everything's like a jungle, you got to control everything. They're talking about that they didn't get their symbiotic needs met. So we're always looking for the psychological meaning underneath their philo philosophical statements. Right? If the trauma takes place, if they did get a negative union with the mother, but they can't leave it at the age of five months, and they're stuck there, that's it. That's a negative symbiosis. They can't leave it. In order for the child to differentiate from the mother psychologically, he needs enough love from her. Positive love. It's, it's an optimal symbiosis, a positive symbiosis. The mother's attuned and so on, meets the need. Right? The mother's there to meet the baby's needs, not the other way around. If it's the other way around, the child can't leave the mother. He's still waiting for the good love. Right? The baby only received conditional love. The baby thinks he has to take care of the mother, those kinds of things. So he's stuck in a negative tar pit. That's too frustrating. Eventually the child identifies with the aggressor. And then he puts and then he's negative towards others to communicate that when he was a baby, his mother was negative towards him. That's a narcissistic pattern, right? So if the child felt devalued when he was a child, he grows up and devalues others to communicate that when he was a child, his mother devalued him and he didn't like it. And he's showing his mother in his mind this through his behavior towards others. It's called a negative magic gesture. And he can just, like Sisyphus, like a broken record, he'll do it all the time throughout his life. And burglar calls that the grand design. They're spending their whole lives trying to show up the mother. If they're so negative and rude and difficult and um, hurtful, uh, that's supposed to embarrass the mother, they think. They're trying to show up the mother. Or they're directly, one author says, they're directly talking to the memory of their mother in the mind. Look, mother in the mind, you see how negative I am towards others? Well, that's what you did to me and I didn't like it. And I'm showing you. And he's stuck like that. Yeah. Now, the positive intention is for him to see that this behavior is like a drama. It's like something on a stage you, you would see. That's like a mirror. So repetition, compulsion, negative magic gesture, projection, right? 
projection, externalize it, externalizing your inner out, repeating the inner, repeating the childhood outward, uh, outwardly in the present. These are kind. These are Lachlan calls it the mirror defense. You're creating a mirror for you to see your unconscious. The unconscious seeks consciousness, right? So the unconscious is doing it by getting the person to demonstrate their childhood traumatic scene by replaying it and repeating it in the present with others. That's like creating this mirror. Again, projection is the means, repetition, compulsion, transference, and so negative magic gesture. That these are that's the means. These are the means of bringing repressed material to consciousness. This is how the the psyche. There's an innate drive for healing. It creates these mirrors for the person to see their childhood, so they can be their own caring witness. Now we need these quotes to help us understand these theories around this. Right? So this is why these quotes are helping us to be our own therapist, our own existential uh, detective. Right? Now, if somebody has the funds, they can fly to New York, find a psychoanalytically trained therapist, and they can do it in two to three years, they say. If not, otherwise, you're pretty much on your own. Um, a good place to start would be this book right here. All right? This is the best introduction to psychoanalysis there is. Now, I've mentioned this a few times already, but uh, in 1955, Four issues of this comic was done. Four issues. Now these four issues of psychoanalysis have have recently been have just recently been, uh, I think in uh, 2020, about two years, year and a half ago or something. These four issues have been reprinted. Have, they've been bundled up and reprinted into this hardback. Right. Now, all, all in all, these four issues represent 12 therapy sessions, okay? So there are three therapy sessions, so there are three clients throughout the series. Three sessions with Freddie, four with Ellen, that's her on the couch there, and five with Mark, right? So there are 12 therapy sessions. This is the best introduction of psychoanalysis there is, uh, hands down, Absolutely the best introduction of psychoanalysis. It's jam-packed. Um, you learn about transference and repetition compulsion, unconscious guilt, uh, dream interpretation. Uh, Mark, Mark uh, has a mother complex, a very serious mother complex. Mis he's a misogynist, right? Womanizer, playboy, very negative towards women because his mother was negative towards him. And then he he, he uh, was negative towards women in response to that. Yeah. Freddie was on the verge of becoming Iago. Iago, all he cares about is, all he has is envy, Iago. Iago is the guy who spreads rumors and gets others against themselves, and he sits back and enjoys how, um, how when he was a child, he managed to get his negative parents against themselves. And that's when he got relief, because uh, in the case of Freddie, his father was hard on him. His mother wasn't really being a mother, and he felt stressed by both. And one day he discovered that he was able to get his father and mother to argue. Now, normally for most children, that'd be a frightening situation. But Freddie is so frightened already that when he saw his parents argue, he felt some relief. He felt some control and power. He preserved his infantile megalomania. He preserved his grandiose self. So at least so he had his false self. Again, the false self is when you take refuge in the grandiose part self. Again, the child has a self. This self has two main components, the true self and the grandiose part self. Now with trauma, the true part self gets repressed because it's too painful. That's called the hungry, enraged, empty part self, or the despised self, the shamed self, the humiliated self, the hated self, etc. Okay, the unloved self, that gets repressed, it's in the unconscious. What's left? He only has the grandiose part self. The grandiose part self is when all babies think everything's about them, that the world revolves around them. When the baby's in the womb, everything's there to serve him. In the extended womb, that continues. And this still continues up until the age of 18 months. 
if he doesn't get enough love to allow that to dissipate naturally at 18 months, he takes refuge in it and he holds on to it and he clings to it. And all he cares about is preserving that. So he wants to make things happen. If he makes his parents argue amongst themselves, he made it happen, so he preserved his narcissism. Right. So this is a very interesting story about the Freddy. Ellen is a very, very excellent story about unconscious guilt. She has social anxiety and so on. Uh, sibling rivalry is there as well. And I just, uh, by the way, I just happened to notice before starting this video, uh, a news item. Uh, Somebody paid a quarter of a million dollars for some 80s uh, children's comic. I thought, wow! This was a well-known children's comic in the 80s. And uh, uh, somebody paid a quarter of a million dollars for a copy of it. I thought, wow, that guy is really... Either he... I thought maybe he wants to pass on the tradition to his children. Maybe he wants to recreate the joy he had when he was a child reading that comic and pass it on to his children. So he wanted a mint copy of it and he was willing to pay. Maybe that's what took place. I thought, or what if he's trying to grieve the loss of his childhood? What if he wanted to a good copy of it so he can recreate uh, some childhood feeling of when he felt safe to recognize um, to recognize the loss so he can do grief work. I'm not sure what his motive, I, I didn't look into it. So it got me curious, so I looked it up, I looked up psychoanalysis, and good news, okay? Uh, there is now an online version of it, okay? So there's the release date, February 26, 2020. So it's almost two years ago, right? So this was reprinted two years ago. Now get this. The digital version of this is now available for only $13.99. Right? That's direct from the publisher, Dark Horse Publishing. Used to be $29.99, used to be $29.99, right? So there it is there. Now it's $13.99. And uh, there are sample uh, pages of it in there. So a little bit of good news. Now the hard, you can still get the hardback uh, for whatever it is. Um, you know, somewhere between twenty and thirty or forty dollars, something like that. Um, if you don't want to get the hardback uh, cover, I recommend getting the hardback. You, know, you never know, right? If this sells out, if this is no longer available, then you only have the digital. But one way or another, I think everybody needs to get this, either in the hardback or um, the online version. Because we'll be covering some more uh, quotes from this collection. We've done several already from all three characters, so we'll do a few more as well. Yesterday we did one from, from uh, as well. Okay, um... So in this um, okay, so in this video we'll be adding a few more quotes to a, a couple of our threads. So we'll add a quote to our thread, a couple of quotes um, to our thread on projective identification. Okay, as a defense mechanism. We'll add a quote on the jargon of what's called part objects. It's related to splitting. So um, there's an overlap there between our our thread on splitting and our thread on object relations theory and within the thread on object relations theory there's the jargon of part objects meaning the baby only sees the mother as either all good or all bad that's a part he's not seeing the mother as a whole he doesn't have the pillow therefore no key therefore no golden ball so you want to heal the part you want to bring the parts together to create a whole right so we have a quote on that um, a quote on the therapy process by burglar and a couple of quotes on the idea of unconscious feelings. And we'll end up with um, a quote from yesterday's video. How are your unconscious memories 
influencing your present day behavior, right? Or you can ask yourself directly, how are my unconscious memories influencing my present day behavior? Okay, just now when I asked myself that question, I thought about emotional eating, yesterday's topic. Another one of our threads, emotional eating. Yeah. If there are unconscious memories around unmet needs for love, that links to emotional eating. Emotional eating is an expression. So, <laughs> okay, so emotional eating is a defense mechanism. So all defense mechanisms are, are there to deal with unconscious memories because they're too painful to feel. If a person has a physical symptom, uh, 90% in 90% of the cases, or even more, Sarno says it's 99, he's, he thinks. Um, he says that uh, physical symptoms are a defense mechanism to distract you from unconscious memories of, of um, being terrified and, and, and angry of, um, of the times when you needed a mother's love, but she was on the phone for too long, those kinds of things. So all defense mechanisms deal with anxiety, right? So if the child is, uh, if the child needs to feed safely with the mother, but the mother's terrifying, he hallucinates that the mother's good. That's called splitting. He makes the decision that he's no good. If the child makes the decision, if he accepts the belief that he's no good because he's being unloved, that's a false belief. That's called the moral defense. He makes this moral decision that he's no good. He feels unworthy and unlovable and all this. It's, it's wrong. It's a false belief. The children did nothing wrong. No child is born guilty. That's ridiculous. But if he's unloved and he feels hurt, he makes this decision and this false belief that there's something wrong with him. Right. So, um, every major defense mechanism is a threat in this series. The moral defense, identification with the aggressor, splitting, projection, projective identification, which we'll do now, rationalization, Emotional eating, physical symptoms as a distraction from right, Sarno's work. Um, we have a thread on the psychology of myths and fairy tales. Right? A myth or a fairy tale is like a dream. It's a soul story. They're true on the inside, not on the outside. Just like a dream, a night dream is true, right? It, everything that happened when you wake up in the morning and you had all these memories of your dreams... They all belong to you. They all belong to one psyche. A myth and a fairy tale, is, it's similar. Myths and fairy tales uh, are, a depiction, are, a, are a depiction of a traumatized psyche. Because the myths and fairy tales, we're still using splitting. That's a, that's a sign of a traumatized psyche, goddess and demon. Mother is just an ordinary human. A confused woman, did her best. Uh, and you, and you forgive her if she couldn't really do that well. You get to that place. So she's just a person. But if you're still operating emotion, from an emotional perspective of goddesses and demons, that's splitting. You're still traumatized. Yeah. So we have a thread on that. Um, we have a thread on the story of Orestes. He's our hero. He's separated from the mother. Okay. He healed the splits. He separated from the mother. He was scared to do it. That was the Furies. Um, and uh, the Furies became gentle feelings in the end. So he succeeded. The Odyssey, he made it home. Okay. He took that journey. It took him 20 years. Okay. That's similar to modern day philosophy. Modern day opinion is that the midlife audit takes 20 years okay. to find our golden ball. Okay. Um, Robert Bly's uh, work is a thread. Our mentors in this series are James F. Masterson, Edmund Burglar, Karen Horney, Melanie Klein, Margaret Mahler, and William Fairbairn. And I think you know Robert Bly sort of makes a guest appearance once in a while. Right? So we'll start here with a quote from Edmund Burglar, one of our mentors. Okay, psychoanalysis uses transference and resistance, defense mechanism, right? 
so transference right you're 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 seeing the present according to your past you're for example um so in so in the therapy room or with your good friend you might see your unloved self onto your friend you identified with the aggressor and then you're negative towards your friend because you want to communicate to your mother in the mind look mother in the mind you see how i'm negative towards my friend well, I'm doing to him what you did to me, and I'm showing you, and I didn't like it. Right. Or you flip it. Um, you accept that you're un that you accept the wounded true self. You project the frightening, rejecting mother onto the other person. Think they're so negative and start blaming them. You see, mother in the mind, see how angry I am at my friend or the therapist or this other person or whatever. Well, I'm showing you how angry I am at you. Can you see it? I'm showing you through my behavior, through this substitute other. You see, that's called transference. The resistance is the use of defense mechanisms to not be aware of unconscious feelings. Okay, we're afraid to be aware of our memories. That's called resistance. Right? Okay, psychoanalysis uses transference and resistance, provided automatically by the client to elucidate the defeat he sustained in infancy okay so he's trying to communicate he calls it here his defeat he tr he's trying to communicate that he had a wish for love and it didn't get met he felt defeated that's what he means right he's trying to communicate that in the present through his behavior he doesn't have words for it, so he shows it through his behavior, through his repetition, compulsion, transference, negative magic gesture, projective identification, coaxing others to play a role. He's trying to he's trying to recreate the childhood scene in the present. That's called projection and transference and transference acting out and parataxic distortion and a few other terms for it. Confirmation bias and a few other terms for it, right? The client uses the chance figure of the therapist. Okay, as a sort of movie screen on which he projects his bygone conflicts. Okay, again, the client uses the chance figure of the therapist, okay, like an opportunity, right? Chance figure, the opportunity, right? The therapist is a safe person, right? A safe substitute person, right? So he's going to project onto this safe person, right? And there's an opportunity, chance figure, right? The client uses the chance, opportunity figure of the therapist, he's safe, as a sort of movie screen on which he projects his bygone conflicts unknowingly and unwittingly, okay? So there's the emphasis there. He's not aware that he's doing it. He's not aware that he's doing it. When a person's engaged in the repetition compulsion, he's not usually aware of it. Back to Burglar, his metaphor of repetition compulsion is that every neurotic uh, is a music enthusiast, but he only has one record. He carries that one record, LP, LP long playing vinyl music disc record. He carries that record with him everywhere he goes. And every time he is a chance, every time he sees a record player, a new situation, a new person or whatever, a safe substitute other, he spins off that record. And he's repeating it over and over again. And he only has that one record. That's, uh, his, and he's not aware of it. That's uh, Burglar's metaphor for the repetition compulsion. Or Sisyphus, in other words, right? So the client uses the opportunity figure, the chance figure of the safe person, the therapist, as a sort of movie screen on which he projects his bygone conflicts. Okay? So the therapist is a safe substitute other. Yeah. It's a safe person. He's there to help you, so he's safe. Now, if the person is not with a therapist, uh, they identify someone in their environment. Oh, he's safe. We'll do it. That's a chance opportunity. So that's a movie screen. So they're going to unwittingly uh, try to recreate the childhood scene. That movie screen is like a mirror. Okay, Projection is the means of bringing repressed material to consciousness. So the therapist facilitates this by offering himself as a mirror, and he's the interpreter as well. Right? But outside the therapy room, the average person is not aware of this. The average person hasn't read this. 
Right? The average person, that's why everyone needs to read this. Right? I think one suggestion, as mentioned in a previous video, on behalf of 1001 Windmills of the Mind, there are 12 therapy sessions in here, in high school, in grade 12. Okay, 12 sessions, do one a week. Spend one hour a week for 12 weeks to cover this book. Take a break and do it again. Spread it out for the year. Spend, a, spend one hour a week all, all through grade 12 English or something. Or social, one one of the classes, right? I think I think that's uh, it'll teach people at a needed age that there's such a thing as unconscious feelings, unconscious motives, right? The iceberg image, we're only conscious partially, but there's so much of us that we don't know. Well, let's get an early start on this. I think high school is a good time uh, to be aware of our motives. Because that's the time when we make career dis career decisions, marriage decisions. If we're making marriage decisions and career decisions based on unconscious motives, um, you know, our life. All right? We can save a lot of grief, right? Okay. Um, so the therapy process. Okay, looks, uses, okay, repetition compulsion, transference, okay, and it looks at uh, how the client is not aware of it, okay. Now this is offered automatically by the client to show his unhappiness from childhood, okay. The client uses the chance figure of the therapist as a sort of movie screen on which he projects his bygone conflicts. He's trying to show the therapist what his childhood was like. A lot of therapists say that in their interpretations. They're saying, by your behavior, you're showing me what your childhood was like. Good. The guy goes, wow, really? By, now, okay, next. By contrasting the projected fantasy, okay, the projected fantasy, with the benign or harmless reality, okay, now, so you want to contrast it. The contrast, the past and the present. The present is harmless. Nothing to do with your childhood. Right? The therapist wasn't your mother who rejected you. The therapist is a different person. Okay? Some kind of emotional understanding is achieved eventually. Right? Eventually. I mentioned earlier uh, that self-help quote called a uh, book called Talk to Me. She had a flash card in there. The wife, um, the, her husband was uh, um, angry about something. I forgot who it was, if it was the husband or the wife. One of them was angry. One of them took that flash card and said, Dear uh, husband or something, I'm not the woman who hurt you when you were a child. I'm the woman in the present. Oh, I'm not the woman of your past. Of your bygone, pa I'm not the woman of your bygone past who hurt you and disappointed you. I'm the woman in your present who cares about you. To make that clarity there, it was a very good little uh, thing I thought. Okay, so by contrasting the projected fantasy with the harmless reality, okay, the harmless reality, his wife uh, loves him, right? As, be as best she can, right? Let's see. He might not say, it's not good enough. What do you mean it's not good enough? I, I can't replicate what you needed in childhood. No woman can do that. So you're saying my love is not good enough, kind of thing. So Because he's expecting too much. Because he unknowingly and unwittingly is projecting the childhood trauma scene of his defeat into the present. The movie screen. The wife, uh, right? The, the, the nice wife is seen as the rejecting mother now. That's, that's the fantasy. And he's reacting to that. And he's interrelating with her as if she's this frightening woman. And, she, and the, 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 the poor wife is shaking her head. What are you talking about? I didn't hurt you when you were a baby in the crib. Uh, I care about you now in the present and all that. And you're trying to blame me for what happened to you in the crib? 
and you have these extreme demands and you're so enraged and wow like so the the, the idea is to make it see uh, when there's trauma in the past and the person projects the past in the present they're still living in the past but no person in the present can heal that past you got to mourn the past not try to relive it you got to mourn it you got to mourn the loss of the love that was needed right okay but before okay but before we get to this emotional understanding okay before the easily accomplished but skeptical intellectual understanding can be transformed you see so you start off with a skeptical see when you first read something like this you're skeptical oh really intellectual okay i can sort of get the idea intellectually but i'm very skeptical right so that's the starting point right so before the easily accomplished but skeptical intellectual understanding being understanding can be transformed by the client into effective emotional experience okay a corrective emotional experience emotional experience the long process of working through is necessary that's called the mourning process right mourning meaning the elucidation of what has already been established through the use of ever new material okay that's the that's the working through process right the mourning process it takes 20 years this can involve dream interpretations okay the client using free association to help him bring unconscious material to consciousness and with free association he is aware of his own un it helps him to be aware of what's unconscious right so there's no hypnosis there he's aware of what he's saying right while he's saying it right and connecting uh, experiences with the present and the making links between the present and the past and so on right now burglar says you got to reach the deepest layer of all this the client's deepest layer in my opinion is unconscious guilt and defenses around the unconscious guilt right so the defenses around unconscious guilt, these are, Burglar says, you, you, you confess to lesser guilty things. His theory is called psychic masochism. Hold on, let me put the light on here. You know, the days are getting shorter. See, the days are getting shorter here. Very quick, quickly. So it's, I think it's minus five out today. You know, I'm just curious if by chance, let's see if the sun is starting to come out. Hold on a sec. Now, once there was a really amazing sunset. I'm wondering if we can ever get that again. Oh, no, still, I'll try a little bit later on. Well, let's see if we get lucky. I'm wondering if maybe in this video, I'm wondering if maybe in this video we might get a glimpse of the of the sunset here. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. On occasion, there's an amazing sunset out there once in a while. Wow. Yeah. Um, so just briefly, um, another one of our threads in this series is Edmund is Edmund's is Edmund Burglar's take on unconscious guilt. He elaborates it. Uh, he kind of fleshes it out and makes it overly complicated, in my opinion. Uh, I have an overly simplified understanding of it, which I'm calling the four steps. Step one: the baby has a wish for his mother's love. Yeah, the mother's on the phone or for, for so whatever the reason is. Uh, it's refused. That's step two. Step three, the child. Okay, so the child's uh, angry. He's enraged. Uh, he wants to protest. He wants to do something, but he can't. He's helpless. He doesn't have motor skills, doesn't have vocal skills. He can't run away to find love from some other place. He can't convince his mother to correct her ways or something or he can't teach his mother on how to be a mother he's helpless he can't do anything he's just lying there 
and he's suffering. So there's um, so he wants to protest, but he can't. That's step three. Step four, the defeat. Okay, the feeling. Yeah, shamed, humiliated. That's a trauma. Now, because the baby thinks the breast is an extension of him, he makes the false belief that he's refusing himself. Now, at the same time, he needs the breast. He needs the attachment to the mother. Okay, So, the connection to the mother, whether real or in fantasy, that's pleasure. But it gets mixed in with the rejection, that's pain. That's a trauma. So his only concept of pleasure is it's mixed up with this pain. Burglar calls it the libidinalization of pain or guilt, psychic pain or guilt. Okay. Now these four steps, let's call the memory of it the superego. Let's just call the memory of it. Because uh, the memory of it is that the psyche seeks healing from this. Okay. Now, in order to seek healing from this, the psyche is going to get, engage in repetition compulsion to help the person be conscious of it. And he, the psyche is going to keep repeating this until the person somehow masters this trauma. But he, in order to master it, he's got to be conscious of it. Okay. So in later life, imagine those four steps. A person has a wish, like the, a real wish from, from themselves. But that triggers the rejection. That's step two. The memory of the rejection. Step three, he wants to protest. But now as an adult, he can protest. He has vocal skills and motor skills. So he's going to protest. But what's he protesting? He's going to protest in a manner where it leads to step four, the defeat. Because he's replaying and repeating the four steps. Okay. And all of this preserves his grandiose part self, his infantile, grand, infantile megalomania. All he has is uh, that he's taking refuge in how he's doing it, how he's making it happen. And that's his identity. And that's his pride. That's his pride that he can do that. Ironically, he takes pride in his he takes unconscious pride in his own self creation of defeat. That's all he has left. His true self his true self is squelched. That's a difficult concept. One of Burglar's colleagues calls it humanity's fourth narcissistic injury. No one wants to hear this. Just like long ago nobody wanted to hear what Copernicus had to say. Everybody was very angry with, with uh, Copernicus. It took hundreds of years for people to accept Copernicus's theory that not everything revolves around the Earth, that the Earth is not the center of the universe, you know, and so on. So that's a difficult idea, right? So how that might look in the present is uh, a person may um, have a wish for... Um, Friendship, let's say, they're going to choose someone they know and who's negative already in advance. There's this uncanny feeling, yeah, I'm going to choose that person. Because uncannily they know it's going to repeat the childhood trauma. So they're going to choose a cold person to try to be friends with them. They're going to be cold and rejecting. Then they felt defeated again. And they, and they created it. Now that behavior is a mirror for them to see their childhood. That's... The psyche's attempt to help the person be conscious of their childhood. They're meant to be conscious of it. If they're creating these disappointments, that's for the person to see that when they were a child, that the mother disappointed them. Then you go, you take a side step, and now you look at the mother and try to work on understanding her and forgiving her and realizing that she was caught in her existential dilemma. She was stuck or caught in her existential net. Uh, and then you look at her story, you read the Enneagram, find out what unhealthy Enneagram type she is. Then things start to make sense. Uh, then you understand yourself. And that's the working through process. It brings up feelings and, uh, and the grief work process as well. Uh, takes 20 years. Right? So that's the deepest layer right, of all this. 
that's not a bad little quote right there actually TQ 1796 okay again so psychoanalysis okay so again psychoanalysis leads to psychosynthesis you synthesize you own you accept you make part of yourself again you integrate into yourself right so, so analysis leads to synthesis that's the idea if analysis doesn't lead to synthesis they say it's, it wasn't a true analysis you got to go further right okay so psychoanalysis leading to psychosynthesis emotional synthesis emotional acceptance and then emotional freedom and so on okay psychoanalysis uses okay transference and resistance provided automatically automatically repetition compulsion is automatically it's like a compulsion automatically okay the psyche seeks healing it's an Im, right it's, it's this drive for healing it's this sort of a it's, it's what the psyche does to help the person try to heal right just like a person you know uh, bumps their leg uh, automatically there's this healing process at play it's nature's way there's this automatic healing efforts take place right there's this constant drive for healing physical healing and emotional healing the body mind is connected see so they, they both happen automatically to elucidate okay to show to highlight to make one aware of to elucidate to make clear enlightenment to see right to elucidate the unhappiness the child experienced in infancy okay he has to see that he has to accept that when he was a baby he was unhappy he's got to get there right okay how does the so how does it work the client uses the chance figure the opportunity figure of the safe person in the present the therapist in this case as a sort of movie screen on which he projects on which he replays his bygone conflicts his in his baby his nursery time conflicts the bygone conflicts okay unknowingly and unwittingly okay uh, that that sentence right there you know that that's so important you know that's a very good part there from burglar we have a lot of great quotes from burglar actually okay next by contrasting the projected fantasy okay that's the past right? with the harmless present reality eventually he's going to get emotional understanding but before he gets this emotional understanding okay first there's going to be he's going to be skeptical okay everybody a lot of people are very skeptical uh, about psychoanalysis right okay so before you transform the skeptical the doubtful intellectual understanding of psychoanalysis right before that can be transformed by the client into emotional experience the long process of working through is necessary meaning okay you got to bring up uh new material right through dream interpretation free associations making links uh giving interpretations right and uh identifying why he does things in the present you know because certain things happen in the past right now the deepest layer of all this is to face the unconscious guilt right so why don't we um just revisit this briefly here with ellen here so the story of ellen in this comic here she's the one on the couch here why don't we just uh re why don't we just revisit that a sec i've read it already in previous videos but i don't mind doing it again because um each time we read it i feel like we get a little bit of a, a little bit of a little better appreciation for it hold on let's see if we can find it here Oh, that, that's uh, that's Freddy, by the way. Yeah, there's Freddy there. That's the guy who's gonna be Iago. Oh, there's Ellen. Okay.
Okay, let's do this one again here. Okay, how's it showing? Let's see, is that it there? Yeah, okay. Wow. Okay, let's start here then. The, uh, the conscious mind is a protector. Okay, what he means is that the conscious mind uses resistance. The conscious mind doesn't want you to be aware, right? Because it's too painful. So that's what he means. The conscious mind or the conscious ego uses maneuvers of the mind. We call these defense mechanisms, right? That's what he means. The conscious mind uses defense mechanisms to protect you from your unconscious, right? Okay, the conscious mind is a protector, Ellen. It protects us from our subconscious. It censors our true inner feelings. Okay? Now, how do you protect yourself from all, all of this pain? Well, blaming is a defense mechanism. Okay? Blaming is a defense mechanism. It's called projection. Blaming is projection, right? By putting the blame on Ted, on your uncle, on your aunt, on every, on everyone, but where it actually belongs, on yourself. You are consciously pro protecting yourself from your true inner feelings. Okay? That's, that's a very good little uh, scene there, right? You are consciously protecting yourself from your true inner feelings. The true inner feelings, that's the unconscious pain. Okay, the unconscious hurt, the unconscious rage, the unconscious shame and guilt. She's protecting herself from her true inner feelings. Now, how do you do it? You distract your mind by through blaming other people for it. Right? You fantasize that it's other, other people are wrong and bad and fault and guilty and no good. But that's how she feels about herself. But she's not aware of it. You see? Again, the conscious mind is a protector, Ellen. It protects us from our subconscious. It censors our true inner feelings by putting the blame on Ted, on your uncle, on your aunt, on everyone. But where it actually belongs on yourself. You are consciously protecting yourself from your true inner feelings. Okay? There are many ways. So there, there are so many ways to, that we protect ourselves from our true inner feelings. Emotional eating, using the food. A physical symptom protects you from your true, in, like a stiff, short back, a sore back. Right? Um, uh, stiff shoulders. That's, that's, so we did a few videos last week on the work of John E. Sarno, just strictly on this point, how physical symptoms protect us from our true inner feelings. If a person has a physical symptom, he says there's a 99% chance that's there to protect you from your true inner feelings. Okay. So physical symptoms can do it. Emotional eating can do it. Blaming others can do it, you know, accusing them of what belong, saying that others have what you don't want to admit that you have. That's projection, blaming. Right? So those are three, three of the ways we protect ourselves from our true inner feelings, from our unconscious feelings. Right? Let's go on. Okay, next one here. I don't understand. Why should I subconsciously feel that I'm so ugly or something when uh, I'm not really, am I? Um, why should I want to drive love away? Okay. So because she felt so badly, see now she's starting to change her mind a little bit, but up, up until that point, she thought she was so unworthy of love and all that, no good and all that. Now she's starting to change a little bit. But, um, so she's in the midway, right? So why should I um, drive love away? So what she was doing, every time a guy liked her, she would automatically assume that he's going to reject her. So 
to protect herself, she rejects first. So if she rejects other people first to protect to, in anticipation of her fantasy that they're going to reject her because she's still stuck with the memory of the mother rejecting her and the sister rejecting her and the mother, right? So she got a lot of rejection as a child. She generalizes that and thinks everyone's going to reject her. So to protect herself, she thinks she better reject first, right? So why, why, so why, why am I driving love away? What am I doing here? Well, because in order to be able to receive love, you must be able to give love. She's, she's, she's too busy rejecting people, so that's why she's not getting love, because she's rejecting people. So how is she going to get love if she's always rejecting people? She has to, like, you know, <laughs> she, she has to stop rejecting people. That means she has to start loving people, and then she's going to receive love. So she's confused here. She says, next one. She says, here, do you mean that I'm not capable of loving? That I have no capacity for love? He says, no, no. I see the emphasis here. Not at all. Okay, this is a false belief, right? Not at all. You're afraid of, you're afraid of love. You have the capacity for love. It's just you're afraid of it. You're afraid of being rejected as you were in your childhood. You're afraid of being hurt. So, in order to protect yourself, you reject first. This is the rejection you've come to expect of others. You sever emotional ties before they grow strong because you're afraid of strong emotional ties. Then, by denying love, by not trusting others, by rejecting them, and not believing them, then I'm actually just so focused on my own trauma all the time. Like, I'm just too focused on myself, making everything... All of my energy is devoted to my unconscious trauma. That's what she means when she says she's being selfish there. She's making it all about herself, right? So in other words, she's living in her own little world about everything's about herself and her trauma and and she's sort of swallowing in her she's stuck in that memory, right? It's a traumatic memory. That's what they mean there. Right? Okay, and he says here, you've made you've made okay, are we here? Hold on a sec. Where are we here? This one here. Oh, sorry. Here this one here. You've made a vital discovery. Most neurotic behavior stems from selfish motivations. Okay, she's focusing on herself all the time. That's what they mean there. Right? In your case, you shifted the burden of guilt from for your unhappiness upon other people instead of yourself in order to protect yourself from self-blame, self-guilt. Okay, so go on, Ellen. What happened after you returned from the farm? She says, um, I, I kept up that, that rejection pattern, that withdrawal pattern I had always followed. I set up a self-made protective shell. Okay, so her self-made protective shell is that she's always going to reject people first before in her fantasy she expects that they're going to reject her. So she's always actively rejecting first. Okay. So one version of it is she's saying to the mother in the mind, look mother in the mind, see how I reject everybody? Well, that's what you did to me and I'm showing you. Okay, so she's trying to be aware of this, to, to come to terms with it, to, to eventually feel it, integrate it, master it, accept it, that kind of thing, right? So she's creating this mirror. So by rejecting others first, she's creating this mirror. At the same time, by rejecting others first, she takes some of the... She anticipates... She, she lessens the sting if she already judges them um, first. Then she's prepared somehow, right? So there's that element too, right? Okay, so she can you so she continued this pattern like Sisyphus. So she, that was a broken record of hers, right? So, for example, um, she went nowhere. She saw no one. And her sister, Youth, tried to include... Okay, so my sister, Ruth, tried to include me in her activities. So there's her sister there. 
How about it, Ellie? Come along. Uh, it'll be a swell picnic. <laughs> it'll be a swell picnic huh, from the 50s. Huh? And, and okay, there, so there she's doing it again. There's the broken record. No thanks. You go ahead without me. I'm perfectly happy to stay home and read. Okay, so she did it again. Broken record. Now she's a little, uh, the sister's getting a little pushy here. Why are you doing this to yourself? Uh, you ought to have a little fun. You're shutting yourself out. You're letting the world pass you by. Look, don't push me. Back off. <laughs> I prefer, that's the mother there, right? She, she's projected the rejecting mother onto the sister there, right? I prefer it this way. I'm, I feel safer this way. It's my life. Um, I don't want to talk about it. Leave me alone. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So she continued this pattern, right? So she went to the city there and there's the work plan, her first job there. See, she's alone there, right? Everybody's ignoring her because they, they've sensed that she's a bit uh, of a, she's, uh, see, they call her a snob, right? So they leave her alone. See, at the school there. You see, the same pattern happens again, right? She overhears a conversation at the locker there, right? One uh, classmate says, are you going to invite her to the picnic? And she says, um, oh, no, she's such a snob. She thinks she's too good for us, the way she keeps to herself. So finally, she says, what is all this? Now it's starting to sink in. The loneliness is starting to sink in. She, she's confused. She says, no, she's wrong. I'm not a snob. What is she talking about? It's just that I'm afraid of people. I have social anxiety. I'm afraid of my clumsiness and um, uh, my inability to mingle. I don't have social skills. I can't small talk. I don't know what to say. Uh, they're going to think I'm uh, socially uh, a klutz and all this stuff. Right? So it's a confusion there. Right? So in other words, others see her... So in other words, other people see her as a snob because she gives people the identity of the rejecting mother. She interacts with people under the assumption that they're going to reject her. So she has a negative thought about people already in advance, unconscious, unknowingly and unwittingly. She has a negative opinion about others. Right? Now, in response to that, she's going to protect herself. So she's going to be standoffish. So other people interpret, call her a snob out of that. Right? The therapist says, so your classmates called you a snob and you believe they're wrong? And she says, of course they're wrong. And she explains it. A snob is a person who looks down upon people, has no respect for them. Isn't that an excellent description of yourself? Now, wait a minute. How can you say that I have no respect for people, that I look down on them? How much respect do you have for Ellen? Can't you see... Can't you see uh, that the songs uh, uh, from the song from the band Delirium? There's a song called Self Saboteur. They sing the line there. Can't you see? Can't you see? You're doing this, right? Can't you see that your subconscious attitude toward yourself is consciously directed at others? Okay, very good. See, that's that's a very good another second insight there. All right. Can't you see that your subconscious attitude that you're not aware of, is consciously being directed at others. That's the mirror. Okay, that's projection. Your conscious negative opinions okay, are like a mirror showing you of what you're denying within yourself. Okay. Can't you see that your subconscious attitude toward yourself is consciously directed at others? Okay, That's called projection. So now she gets it. She says, I never thought of that. So now she gets, she's starting to get it. 
You have a contempt. Because she's starting to get it, he now brings it more closer to the surface, right? You have a contempt for yourself, even a loathing. Okay? So why would she have a, a loathing for herself? Okay? She was rejected by the mother. To preserve the attachment to the mother, she has to do to herself what her mother did to her. So the mother rejected her. To stay connected to her, she has to reject herself. This repetition compulsion is called self-loathing. Right? This repetition compulsion of rejecting yourself. Again, the mother rejected her. She needs the mother even more. The only way to stay connected to the mother is if she mimics her. She mimics her mother's behavior. What, what was her mother's behavior? The mother's behavior was to reject her. So now she rejects herself to stay, to stay loyal to the mother, to have that connection to the mother. So that's, that's the self-loathing, what, he, what he's talking about. Okay. You have a contempt for yourself, even a self-loathing. You think you're not worthy of love. Okay, that's the false belief, right? Hence, you've withdrawn into a shell. You blame yourself for the rejection you felt as a child. Okay, that's the moral defense. She accepts the attitude that she's no good. That's the moral defense. Okay. That facilitates the hallucination that the mother is good. The number one priority for the baby is to think that the mother is good, even if it, even if it means they have to accept and create this false belief that they're no good. Yeah. Okay, you have come. To this was okay. So you, again, you think you're not worthy of love, hence you've withdrawn into a shell. You blame yourself for the rejection. You blame yourself for the rejection. Okay, that's a false belief. You have come to expect this rejection from everyone. Okay, so she's generalized this, right? She's projecting the rejecting mother onto the world. Right? You d Therefore, you divorce yourself from people because you look down upon yourself and can't believe that they could accept you and offer you love. Right? So that's the repetition compulsion. Everyone is the rejecting mother, in other words. But you discovered in past sessions that your childhood rejection was not of your making, Ellen. This is a problem with your mother, not you. You didn't make this rejection, right? So here's where a person can go to the self-help. Uh, um, if you look up the, the scroll marked number four by Ogmandino, he has a poem called Nature's Greatest Miracle. How each person is nature's greatest miracle. You are nature's greatest miracle, right? That's the truth. That's the basic, right? If you look at any uh, blue jay, that's, that's a nature's greatest miracle. Each person um, has the beauty of like that, right? Everything in nature is, is a unique, beautiful creation of nature, right? Okay. Um, so, your childhood rejection was not of your making. You had no control over it. Okay? It was not, it was caused by many factors not involving you. Okay? So, normal, natural, healthy development is, I'm okay, you're okay. That's homo sapiens. This is, this is the way it's been for 150,000 years. It was, I'm okay, you're okay. okay. When a baby gets enough love, they feel okay. That's normal, that's natural, that's what's supposed to normally happen. The baby's supposed to get enough love, his conclusion is he's okay and his mother's okay. And everyone else has the same experience, and everyone walks around with feelings that they're okay and others are not okay. Everything else is trauma and aberration. You're not okay, and you're no good, and prejudice, and all of these other that's trauma. That's all a symptom of trauma. Yeah.
Okay? So it wasn't your fault, okay? Not of your, not involving you, not of your making. Why continue to blame yourself? Okay? Or judge people by the emotional judgments of your childhood. Okay? That's another way of saying it. Why? Again, why continue to blame yourself or judge people today by the emotional judgments of your childhood? All right? Can you see it okay? Why continue to blame yourself or judge people today by the emotional judgments of your childhood? So he's confronting the repetition compulsion. He's trying to bring all of this conscious. How are we doing here? Yeah, it's a little, little bit of a, some snowflakes here. Oh, there's the moon. Yeah, the moon is out. Well, I'm kind of curious to see if there's any on the other side here. Hold on a sec. Let me take a little break here. A little break here. Oh, there's the sun, yeah. So you got the moon, you got the sun on the west here. There's the sun there. <laughs> you know, one time the whole sky had like like a dozen different layers of red. It was really amazing, you know. So that's a, a deep point. Now somebody reading this comic or hearing me talk about it, maybe they're skeptical. Don't judge it by my delivery of it, right? I'm not an orator or a professional speaker or none of these things. So don't, don't judge it by my, by my delivery of it, right? Judge it for yourself. Right? Remember Robert Bly's slogan um, that it, that it's up to you to figure out for yourself what works for what what. Everyone is on this journey according to their individual. Everyone has their own individual labyrinth. Right? But that's what we all have in common that we have a labyrinth. See, everyone's labyrinth. On this maze-like structure to heal ourselves, this hero's journey, this monomyth. Everyone has this labyrinth, this maze-like structure. And that's what we all have in common, that we all have it. Even though it's a little bit unique for each person, that's what we all have. So there's our shared sort of um, commonality, right? Ubuntu. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next one here. Projective identification. Okay, projective identification includes situations in which, for example, some people you meet always make you feel intelligent and attractive, sometimes called the golden projection, because they genuinely believe that those traits could never be theirs. For example, a child may have an elder brother 
um, who is more intelligent and more academic than she is. But if this fact of her family history has led her to believe that everyone is more intelligent, right, and that she is not, she may not only see others as more intelligent, but also she may be more active about it by consciously impoverishing her own personality, right? She may be allowing or inviting or inducing others to think of her, to do the thinking for her in situations where she could do it for herself. So this is just one example of our thread on projective identification. She's saying here, she doesn't believe that she that she's because she didn't she did okay in school, but it ended up where she made this conclusion that she can't think for herself. So she coaxes others. You make the decision. So her undeveloped ability to make her own logical conclusions or whatever. Um, uh, she's unaware of it. If she's not aware of it, she, she sees it in others and interacts with others that they have it. Now, if they have it, she expects them to provide uh, the answer uh, and she coaxes them and interacts with them with that expectation, and the other person senses it. So this phenomena of where you, something you don't know about yourself, you see it onto others, that's projective identification. You project and then you identify. You give the other person the identity of something that you that belongs to you. If it's a positive trait, it's called a golden projection. But normally, with projective identification, the idea is to not want to feel something. To keep it outside. Like Ellen there, she didn't want to, um, she didn't want to admit uh, that she has, that she, that she still, that she's still using the moral defense, where she makes the conclusion that she's no good. She just thinks others are no good, and then interacts with them on that identity that she that she invented for them that they're no good and that they're rejecting people and then she withdraws in response to protect herself from her own fantasy projection yeah. so that's one way projective identification is used right to keep something repressed if you don't want to admit something about yourself you you interact with people um, by, by assigning them, by manufacturing some identity for them and thinking that they have this identity and that keeps something repressed. Okay. What did he say there? Your true inner feelings. You don't want to be aware of your true inner feelings. So one way to not be aware of your true inner feelings is to give other people some fake role Assume they have this role and operate from that assumption. And that helps you, that distracts you from your true inner feelings. That's one way it works. Another way it works is that the therapist feels this right, and offers an interpretation. Another way it works is that, let's say with two friends, a person is feeling anxious, but they don't know they're feeling anxious. They're communicating in a way to coax their friend to feel anxious. The friend might say, you know, when I arrived here, I was feeling pretty calm. Uh, half an hour has passed and now I'm starting to feel a little anxious. I'm wondering if maybe you're feeling anxious and you're not aware of it. Says, oh my God, am I making you feel anxious? You know what? I, I yes, I'm glad you brought it up. Now that you mentioned it, I am feeling anxious. Okay, good. Well, let's talk about it. So it's benign that way. So friends pick up on it and they talk about it. And so friendships do that, right? Um, um, 
because there's trust there, the other person's going to say, I think you're feeling anxious. So the friend can call him out on it. Yeah. And the person will go, thanks for that. Yeah. Another version of it is that uh, another person, maybe they're not close friends. Another person uh, wants to make another person feel what they're not feeling because misery loves company. That's another version of it. And there are a couple of other versions of it. So, for example, with prejudice, yeah, um, if a person has a memory of being unloved and they've identified with the aggressor, okay, so they felt devalued as a child and then they do to others what the mother did to them, that's prejudice, so they find some chance figure, okay, an opportunity figure, that's a safe substitute other, they're safe. They can be safe because they're a therapist, they're safe, or they can be safe because they're wounded, and you think, oh, they're safe. So you find someone who's safe, maybe they're just a healthy person, natural, caring, kind person, oh, they're safe. You find some chance, okay, safe person, you see your unloved self onto them, you give them an identity, you say they're, you say they're no good, and then you put them down, because you want to communicate to your mother in the mind, look, mother in the mind, you see how negative I am towards this safe person? Well, when I was a child, I was safe, and you put me down, and I'm showing you this through my behavior. That's called a negative magic gesture. Now, by doing this, unknowingly and unwittingly, usually, um, the person stays away from their true inner feelings. It's a defense against unconscious pain, a defense against their unconscious feelings. So the prototype of projective identification is, is the fusion between the baby and the breast. When the baby's stressed, the breast comforts the baby. Okay? If that gets met, everything's fine. The child no longer needs to coax others to, to soothe them. If the, if, the, if the baby is distressed, and the mother's not available, the child might make sounds, he might squirm around, he might kick or something, he might make a face, or he might squirm, or he might scream, he might, he might do something, non-verbally, he might do something to coax the mother to recognize that he's under distress. So the theory is, he's trying to get the mother to feel what he's feeling. The baby's trying to force his mother to have empathy for him, put it that way. That's the theory, right? So the baby wants the mother to feel what he's feeling because the mother is him, right? The mother is a part of him. So when we say he wants the mother to feel what he's feeling, this comes from the theory that the, that, uh, the breast is a self-object for the child. The breast is there to serve him. It's a part of him to serve him. Differentiation hasn't taken place yet. Fusion is still there. Symbiosis is still there. That's why they say he wants to coax the other to feel what he's feeling. Right? He wants the breast um, to feel what he's feeling because the breast is him feeling it. He, he's, it's part of it's him kind of thing. It's a part of him. Thinking that if the breast can get the message,